Good. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this morning's uh, webinar. Or actually, I'm told nowadays you can't use that word webinar because it's uh, it's been uh, um, copyrighted. Um, but today's meeting, um, obviously. What we're looking at is South Africa's retail during the COVID web webinar, um, during COVID, and how that has changed the, um, the outlook and the environment, and the ecosystem of uh, retail, and whether, whether that will continue. So I'm joined by two distinguished speakers, Queen and uh, Peter. And uh, I will give a quick overview to start with, and then they will give their uh, presentations. We will have uh, time for questions after uh, my presentation. Uh, if you wish to use the, um, the, the chat box, I'm trying to see if I can find it, but I can't see it on my screen. Um, but presuming I can find it <laughs> before the end of my presentation, um, then on the chat box or on the Q&A, please put in your questions. Uh, at the end of the whole presentation, um, we will have 10 minutes for Q&As. Uh, so don't worry if you, you haven't been, uh, uh, if, you've, if you've missed putting in questions beforehand. Feel free in any case always to ask questions. This is an interactive, not just us preaching to you, so please don't think that. So um, if I can uh, also please thank IT News for putting on this uh, conference. It was a, it's a great initiative and we, uh, we look forward to many more of their initiatives uh, as we go forward. It's so much easier nowadays to have a conference online even though I miss the, uh, the personal contacts that a conference uh, gives. So please, um, let's uh, roll up my, my slides. So what we know obviously um, from press is that there have been considerable changes. Um, I, I put down just a few, things that I've picked out of the press recently, uh, for example, Pay You said that uh, they, their business on food, just food sales increased by 500% from March to July. Um, PayFast said that uh, cost, uh, the, 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 uh, the purchase online of apparel increased by 800%. It's, it's clear that that is happening. And a very interesting thing is that in countries where the lockdown was fierce, as it was here in South Africa, and also in places like Tunisia and Morocco, the, co the, uh, uh, the amount of e-commerce increased noticeably, really noticeably. Whereas in other countries with less lockdown, like Nigeria and Kenya, it increased um, at a more modest rate. And in countries with no lockdown, such as Tanzania, there was no increase in e-commerce during this period. So Jumea has been a, a nice case study in that. Um, at the same time, there's always the saying, African solutions for African problems or African challenges. Uh, there have been an enormous number of FinTech and e-commerce related developments throughout Africa over these last eight months. It has been absolutely phenomenal. I've, I monitor this, uh, we have a newsletter uh, and I report on it. It is phenomenal, the, the new, uh, developments that are coming out that are pouring out as a result of the stimulus of the um, of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
So I suppose in any cloud, there is a silver lining and that silver lining is e-commerce. The next slide, please. Um, what we suffer here in South Africa is a lack of data. We're a new industry, a new sector, and we don't really have very good data. Um, we know, for example, that um, the, uh, um, there's around about 18.3 million e-commerce users in 2017, um, and that's obviously going to increase, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't, we, we don't have good data. Um, the global uh, organization that collects data, which is called Statistica, estimated e-commerce in South Africa to be worth 3 billion US dollars in 2018. But the Worldwide Walks, who does a report uh, online uh, retail in South Africa, uh, found only a quarter of that in 2018. So there are big differences in the data that we do have, and it's not very good. Can I, can I um, go on to the next slide, please? So therefore, we really need, as an industry, to look at how uh, our industry is measured and to try to improve it. There's no data whatsoever on uh, consumer to consumer. And yet we know that enormous number of people are using Facebook uh, and other social media to sell. They may be a sole proprietor, as they call them, or they may even just be an individual who sells something that they um, that they make at home. But none of that is being recorded at all. And so the, the, there is very little knowledge and there is not any knowledge either um, of the amount of services that are sold or government services for that matter. We must remember government is also in the e-commerce business. The University of Amsterdam did a study earlier this year where they found that there were 610 e-markets of different sizes. Most of them were specialized. Most of them were things like we buy cars, specializing in one product. Um, South, uh, South Africa had 106 of those e-marketplaces. And we know uh, from looking at build, build with, for, for example, which is an international um, in, information source, that there are around about 8,300 e-shops using platforms like WooCommerce or uh, Shopify, etc., in South Africa. But as I said, that is only a tiny part of the iceberg. It's the tip of the iceberg. And possibly there may be up to 80,000 e-merchants of some sort or other active on social media. So we need a much better idea of the source size of our sector. Next slide, please. So how can we, how can you help us to collect data? And I, I'm really putting this out to you. Um, please do help because it's, it's extremely important. If people know the size of uh, the industry, it's much more likely that people will then invest in that industry. We have a serious problem of people not investing in e-commerce in South Africa and indeed within the whole of Africa. So we've started to work with five universities on that. We've asked the DTI for help. Uh, we've asked the banks, the payment gateways, the credit card operators for help. Uh, and we've also been approached by a major consumer goods company to study consumer attitudes to e-commerce. Uh, all these sorts of things are incredibly important to grow our business and to grow our sector and to show that our sector is actually serious because we are now serious. We may be around about, by the end of the year, around about 5% of the total um, retail market in South Africa. Uh, instead of being 
as was uh, forecast a couple of years ago, only 2%. So this is a very big, uh, big change. Next slide, please. Um, this, this does raise a question, and I know there's a lot of um, press, negative press has, has come out on it, uh, about whether e-commerce is actually destroying bricks and mortar retailing. I, um, I've written a, 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 a paper on this, or covered part of this, um, which showed that, in fact, um, e-commerce creates as many jobs as those which are lost by bricks and mortar in, in developing countries, and that that should be the case also here. But, but of course, COVID has changed the whole um, outlook. Um, we can expect uh, significantly lower disposable incomes uh, because of uh, un high unemployment. Uh, there's the weaker RAND that we have to consider, etc. So we are in um, a, well, in a serious economic problem here uh, in South Africa, and that will make a difference to, on retail as much as on any other business. Next slide, please. Uh, so what is a, the solution? Well, um, I don't believe, I don't think anyone seriously would believe that that uh, people will simply stop going to shopping malls. It's part of our DNA. Um, but I do believe that consumers and businesses will use much more online to research prices, look for cheaper or more reliable sellers, reduce transport costs, and, and indeed for their own convenience. And that's um, what is happening in other countries too. It is much more con convenient to have something delivered to you at your house uh, or in a click, click and collect uh, situation than to have to go into uh, large supermarkets, for example. And I think omni-retailing, or at least multi-channel retailing, is the obvious solution. It's been around for ages, but it really is becoming now something of great importance for South Africa. Next slide, please. So finally, um, the e-commerce forum South Africa was set up to ensure trust for online shoppers. Um, it's obviously very important that trust is developed and nurtured by online uh, sellers. We've introduced a trust mark, which is called Safe Shop. This is, uh, in fact, a European trust mark. It's used in other countries um, like Brazil and Hong Kong. Um, and it has an icon, which you see on the side of your shop, um, which shows that that shop is complying with all the laws, the relevant laws, the Consumer Protection Act, the um, uh, Privacy Act, uh, company law, etc. And the trust mark allows the consumer also to make an online dispute resolution complaint in the rare event that the seller and the buyer fail to solve a problem. In most cases, 99.9%, .9 a solution is found. But in case the solution is not found, then uh, there is a need for a, uh, a backstop, if you like it. So anyone who wants to know more about that uh, the, um, the link is there. Let me finish my presentation on that note. Um, I can't actually see uh, my, uh, if there are any questions. Uh, so I will move, thank you. <laughs> I will move on now to, um, uh, to, let me just see quickly. No, there's nothing here I can, quickly see. So let me move on now to, to Queen. Um, Queen has been for over 25 years, she says, uh, in the financial sector in some way or another. She started in Standard Bank. Uh, she moved into consultancy. She then worked for the Consumer Goods Council, which as you know, is the key 
Association for Consumer Goods in South Africa. Consumer Goods Council set up under the Consumer Protection Act a consumer ombuds and Queen moved to that um, nearly 10 years ago, I think. Um, the, uh, she is also a mentor, uh, she has a, a foundation and she mentors uh, young students in um, business and life. So uh, please Queen, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me this morning, and it's an honor to be part of this webinar. Uh, I think we are survivors that we made it this far over the past few months were not easy for anyone, but I'm happy that uh, we are all here and we made it this far. So I'm going to take you through a, a short uh, presentation, which uh, I think, let me just quickly start it over. Are you able to see it on your side? Okay, thank you. Just a brief uh, background. I think that while most of the people are familiar with who we are, Maybe it is beneficial that I give you an overview of where I come from, as uh, Alistair has said. Thank you so much, Alistair. I am the CEO of the Consumer Goods and Services Ombud, and uh, most of the people already are familiar with the institution, but just for the benefit of those that do not know, the CGSO is a compulsory industry scheme which was established in 2013 in terms of the section 82 of the Consumer Protection Act. Uh, we operate under the Consumer Goods and Services Industry Code of Conduct, which was uh, promulgated by the Minister of Trade and Industry in April, 2015. And then about the organization itself, since inception, we have dealt with over 110,000 calls through our in-house call center. And we have also opened over 37,200 cases and closed 33,808 complaints. Uh, our role in the society or within the Republic of South Africa is to resolve disputes that arise between consumers and suppliers of goods and services. Uh, it doesn't end there. We also ensure that there is fairness in the industry. And we also engage with suppliers in order to make sure that they have a customer centric culture. And we do that through education that we give to small and uh, bigger players in the industry. And how do we do this? We do this by looking at the trends in the industry. We look at the type of complaints that are being received. We also engage with suppliers of goods and services to try and change some of the practices in the industry. Because at times we do pick up that the, some of the suppliers are practicing some of the uh, acts which are not good for consumer or which are not ethical or which are against the Consumer Protection Act. So as the topic of today already suggests that there are five ways in which the pandemic has changed how we shop. And I believe that all of us are consumers in our own, way, in, in our own ways. Being suppliers, we are also taking part in the retail sector, but we are also consumers. And you can attest with me that the, this pandemic and the lockdown has really changed us in one way or another. So in many ways, we have changed the way we do things. And we've also gone through different hashtags during this time. And we've done everything possible in order to cope during this time. I remember that I also baked, we cooked, we did a lot of things together. And I know that even within the business itself, we have tried several things 
I know of other businesses that have, uh, within a very short space of time, have introduced new products that they never produced before because they were informed by the period in which we were in. So we have now embraced the new normal. And a lot of people are also working from home. I've also observed that the States SA have, in their report for August 2020, they have reported that in the retail trade, the sales have decreased overall by about 6.6 in the three months between August 2020 and the few months before that. And that obviously is happening now when the lockdown is being eased from level three to level four, I mean, to level four to level three. So as the, the country is opening up, you can see that uh, the retail sales are starting to, to pick up. And I'm sure that it's the same even across the entire uh, globe, not only in South Africa, throughout the entire world, there is a lot of changes. There are a lot of changes that are being introduced as we go. People have moved now from doing shopping through our historical way of doing things, and now they have moved to online. And as Alistair has said earlier, that people are starting to trust the e-commerce. They've started to, they're starting to trust uh, not only brick and mortar shops, but they are already now putting their faith even on online shopping. So in our office, we have also measured some of the trends, as I said earlier, that we do this through checking what are the trends in the industry. We compared uh, the three quarters of the year with the prior year. And what we have picked up is indeed, I can confirm what Alistair is saying, that the public has now started to trust the online world. So in the first quarter, as you can see on the slide that I've shared, uh, the sales or the, the complaints that we have received in our office through online. I've now I'm now sharing only the online complaints. There are many other complaints that came through which we did not measure. For now, I just want to share with you how the online purchases have increased over the past uh, period of the lockdown. If you compared in quarter one, the sales have increased or the online complaints in our offices in quarter one have increased by over 80% compared to the prior year. Quarter two, the complaints of online purchases have increased by over 640% compared to the prior year. And the same happens even in quarter three. The complaints in last year in quarter three were only 85 for online purchases, but this year already between the period of July and September, we have received more than 436 complaints. This really confirms that people have now uh, started to be comfortable. That is one of the ways in which we have changed the way we are doing shopping. But also you would ask yourself, what are people uh, complaining about. Alistair said earlier that there is not much data, but through the complaints that we receive, we have started to record what are the people saying, what are the consumers saying, because that is going to be very vital in us who are trading in the retail uh, or in the goods and services industry to listen to our consumers and hear what they are saying. So through the complaints that we have received, we have picked up that most of the companies or most of the suppliers uh, were not ready to deal with this pandemic. And I must say, none of us were ready. But in terms of business, I think as much as uh, digi digitization was seen as a cherry on the cake, I think during this, during this period, it has become the cake itself. Because there is no business that will be able to survive without uh, being available in the retail, in the online space to be able to meet uh, your customers' needs. So what are the customers complaining about? We have picked up that uh, most of the consumers are complaining that uh, the delivery of goods were not on time. So that shows that 
while we were ready and retailers were stocked up and having goods to deliver to our consumers, we were not ready to deliver to our consumers throughout the lockdown because we're used to where consumers will walk into our shops and walk out with their products. So a lot of people moved to that space, but the delivery side was not taken care of. Many consumers were uh, complaining that to some extent, some of the people did receive what they ordered, but in most cases, things were not as per, as per the promise from the, the suppliers, or they were not delivered on time and more worst enough that we have picked up is that suppliers were not communicating with their, with their consumers. Communication is going to be very key. While most of our suppliers are, have presence on the in, online where they're able to have a website and email, but there was nobody on the other side to pick up the calls where consumers were frustrated. And as I said earlier, we, one of our, uh, our mandate or one of our duties as the Office of the Consumer Goods and Services Ombud is to make sure that uh, consumers do receive redress when they need it. If anything goes wrong with the consumer that they have, with the, with the goods that they have bought or services, they should be able to go back to the suppliers. But much of the frustration from the consumer side that we have experienced is the fact that there was nobody, through the, especially through the hard lockdown, because there was nobody to pick up the calls. And where consumers want to return stuff, they were not able to return. And most of that was because uh, when the, the retailers were completely closed, consumers were not allowed to examine the goods before they can make a decision of whether they are buying or not. So as a result, they will buy and receive things and when, it, when they go through that, they realize that it's not what they have ordered or it's not serving the purpose which they had intended. So they were frustrated that they are not able, the channels through which consumers are supposed to complain or communicate with the supplier were not open. So that was a challenge. But you will see also that was followed by agreements and cancellation. We are aware that during the first part of the lockdown when it was hard, Consumers, obviously, those that have pre-booked some of the flights and the hotels had to cancel. So you will see that that throughout the next quarter, it dropped a bit because most of the people would have canceled in the very first time when the lockdown was introduced. But the goods and being de defective also continued to increase. Service, service standards were not up to standard because consumers were not satisfied on how the suppliers are, are meeting their needs. So that is information that we need to also take into consideration. Delivery, not as per the order. And that is a lot of a challenge, especially where people are buying online because things will appear in a certain way, but when the delivery comes through, you see that the color, if in, in terms of apparel, as Elista talked about the percentage changes that happened throughout the, the, the lockdown. There were a lot of purchases that happened towards the, the, the past few months, but most of the people are complaining that things are not as per order uh, or not as per the promise. So that is information that suppliers need to take into consideration in making sure that they are able to thrive throughout this whole period and remain and be able to, sur to survive throughout the COVID. So the lessons that we pick up from that is that, okay, I've already spoken about most people have shifted to digital shopping. Secondly, people are now, cons consumers are now shopping anytime and anywhere. And this also include cross-border purchases. They are not only confined to purchasing in the neighborhood or through the, the brick and mortar stores, they are now shopping anywhere. And another thing that we've also picked up is that consumers now have the ability to compare prices. That means that suppliers no, no longer have the, 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 the luxury of, of charging uh, ridiculous prices. 
because during this time, before a consumer can make a decision, they have so many other suppliers who are competing for the same pocket. So that means that you need to make sure that your pricing is also good in order to get consumers because they have now access to other uh, stores in and outside of the, of the Republic where you are. What we also picked up is that uh, consumers are shopping for essentials. Because of the lockdown, families had to stay together. So that means people also learned to do things together as a family. So a lot of consumers moved now to the DIY section of things. So we've seen people may, brewing their own beers from home, baking their own breads and all that. So that means people, although this was already within us, people then started to look within and take out some of the things that due to the, the technology or the, the modern world in which we are living, they had, uh, they had ignored. Now they're starting to go back to the old way of doing things. People have now started their own gardens in their backyards. People are now planting their own vegetables. So you can see that uh, discretionary spending has also decreased during this period of the long lockdown. People are now looking more into buying essentials. And you also pick up that impulsive buying also has gone down because people are only looking at essentials and the things that they really, really need. So these things are giving us a message as retailers. That means that consumers are asking for something from us. And these are the few things that I've listed, which I've picked up from the, from the uh, complaints that we have dealt with, that consumers are asking for agility. When you walk into a brick and mortar store, you buy stuff and you walk out holding your products that you have paid for. Now with e-commerce, that has been taken away. But consumers are, because they're now complaining that uh, their products are taking long, longer to be delivered, that means that suppliers need to be innovative in terms of how do we get products sooner to the consumers? What is it that we can do to make sure that consumers get their whatever they have ordered as quick as possible? Secondly, this is calling for partnerships within the, the supplier uh, supply chain. For instance, if you buy things, now the retailers have to partner with courier companies, for instance, in order to deliver whatever. And if one of the suppliers are not coming to the party or they're not putting their whole, pulling their whole weight, that means it gives disappointed to the whole transaction because it's not only one supplier that is involved, now it's pulling other suppliers to work together to deliver to our consumers. Can I can I quickly say, Queen, could could you wrap up um, okay. because the time is going past. Thank you. Okay, no problem. We've already talked about the online uh, presence, the redress. Redress is very important in order to be able to retain our consumers. And then lastly, maybe I've already spoken about the service standards, defective goods, and suppliers not delivering what they have promised and they, them not being able to communicate to their consumers. So I think lastly, in conclusion, what I want to highlight mostly in the retail space is to make sure that uh, consumer centricity is going to be very important in the next phase in which we are going to move into. Suppliers need to be innovative. We need to close the gap in terms of communication and we need to make sure that we treat complaints as feedback to improve our service. This is going to be very critical in order for us to be able to thrive uh, post COVID. And as they say, data is the new oil. And Alastair kept on saying more and more times that we really need to gather data and be able to uh, process it properly so that we can be able, it can inform us on how we are going to move forward. Thank you very much for this time that you have provided to me. And I believe that this has brought in some insight. Thank you. Indeed, Queen, you brought in some extremely interesting uh, insights. And I think stressed 
uh, the great importance of proper communications with, with the consumer. Um, if we live in a online world, we've got to expect that people respond in an online way and that those complaints uh, will be shared by a lot of people. I mean, in the old days, they used to say that if you uh, had a product, uh, someone bought it, they didn't like it, they'd tell 10 of their friends yeah. that that product wasn't working properly. Nowadays, they're telling 100 of their friends uh, because their friends are people on Facebook, people on LinkedIn, etc., etc., etc. So I think this is uh, up the ante, as they say, for customer relations. And this then brings me on to um, uh, Peter's uh, final presentation. Uh, Peter is the principal solutions consultant at Genesis and has had over 17 years of experience related to customer services and the experience industry. Um, I can't say more how important customer relations is. Um, and I think really Queen's presentation has highlighted that more than any other way. So over to you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Queen. Thank you, Alistair, for the introduction. Um, I'll, uh, I'll just put my video on so everybody can see that I'm a real person and not a bot uh, in these days. Um, I'll switch off my video just to for some bandwidth uh, sparing um, so, uh, and I'll get started. Right, so um, retail the age of COVID-19. Um, the purpose of my presentation is really just to talk more around the technology side of things and how we as um, providers to the consumers out there, and us, I, I suppose uh, us being consumers ourselves, how do we enable everything that Alice has been talking about as well as Queen. Queen also touched on a lot of important uh, points in the presentation. So very quickly, what is Genesis? So Genesis is more than just a, a contact center software company. We provide ourselves or we'll pride ourselves in being a global leader in customer experience technology, um, in enabling our customers to provide personalized connected moments to their customers through artificial intelligence, engagement channel orchestration, and workforce engagement. Very important, never, never to forget that it's not just about serving our customers, but also to look after our actual employees. And with a global network of more than 1,200 partners, 11,000 11, customers, um, and being at the center of 70 billion interactions per year, uh, we've learned from these interactions that customers want personalized experiences that are contextually relevant to them in the very moment they need it. And that's why experience as a service starts with people and personalized contextually relevant experiences at the moment they need them. So what is experience as a service, you may ask? It's our vision of an empathetic customer-centric experience. The customer at the center and empathy being the core of any good relationship and good communications. Of course, in, in this day and age and now, specifically empathy is even more important uh, uh, to understand our customer needs. And to show the other party that you know them, that you care enough to learn about them and then remember what they've shared with you in the past, especially in this time of crisis. We're using AI to leverage all of the customer employee data, coming back to the data is, is, is the new well, um, including historically third party, uh, historical third party and behavioral data that has been shared from website visits, digital engagements, store visits, um, or calls in the past. And we're also engaging at the right moments across the entire customer experience from marketing and sales and customer care at, uh, or service. So again, experience as a service is uh, personalized, empathetic, customer centric communications that demonstrates empathy in order to establish trust with the customer that you know them and you know what they need. And then of course, which leads to loyalty by showing the customer that you know them. It's all about the empathy. In a time of disruption in both personal and uh, professional lives across the entire customer life cycle from marketing to sales to support. So to understand how this applies to the topic of my presentation being retail in the age of COVID-19, we need to take a quick look at the trends impacting the retail industry. Retail customers are fierce, fickle bunch and empowered more empowered than ever before. They're capable of getting things done and have become expert at being consumers. Now, obviously these, the, the batch of consumers that we typically see online has obviously increased recently uh, due to the circumstances, but 
people are pretty much digital, digital savvy people. Retailers, of course, have trained many loyal of their many loyal customers to wait for promotions, markdowns, and uh, return products. Do nothing to grow high-value customers as such. This vicious cycle of price slashing uh, is not sustainable. So retail profits, uh, profit margins are razor thin, and digital first competitors, especially, are playing the long game when it comes to profitability. And then, of course, on top of that, we've got a very high percentage of shopping cart abandonment that compounds this problem. Top reasons for cart abandonment being extra costs and too expensive shipping options. Uh, the site perhaps requires the creation of an account. People are not, although this is seeming to change, the trend is, seems to change. People are very hesitant of providing personal information. They, uh, obviously, everybody wants to you know, be safe online. And then of course, too long or complicated checkout processes, um, et cetera, et cetera. Then, on top of that, we've got the omni-channel convenience gap. The retailers are often multi-channel rather than omni-channel. So they focus on how to sell rather than what customers need to help them to purchase in the first place. So by bringing multiple channels together, connecting physical, online, and mobile interactions, brands can deliver consistent, supportive customer experiences across every touch point. We need to put the customer in the center of the shopping journey, and every interaction becomes an opportunity to create brand awareness. The product is made available across all avenues of the shopping journey from discovery to research to purchase, and it helps increase the likelihood that a consumer will buy no matter where, the, where they ultimately decide to do so, whether that would be you know, going out actually to the store um, and purchasing things now that we're allowed to, or going online. The experience should be the same or the same product should be available across the board. And then of course, the supply chain transformation is required. Again, also touching on what Queen was referring to. According to KPMG's Nunwood's 2018 Customer Experience Excellence Analysis Report, <laughs> mouthful, uh, logistics suppliers were widely regarded as the weakest link in the retail universe at this point, in time, or, and I think it currently are. Uh, I think they're also feeling the brunt of the change in customer behavior. The supply chain in retail needs to be more than a support function. It needs to be transformed to cover end-to-end -end service from forecast to distribution. As a result, customer care has become a primary function within the overall retail supply chain. The retail opportunities lie with the retailers that offer superior customer service from simple returns, coming back to that returns um, uh, uh, fact or factors that's been discussed um, of online purchases, ability to just click and collect and the ability to order online while in store when items were out of stock, as an example. The supply chain has become more complex than ever before. Interesting though, 79% of consumers want free return shipping and that as many as 67% of shoppers check the returns page before they actually purchase online. Again, reinforcing um, the, the notion of returns, especially now where we, you know, every day we have the doorbell ringing with the delivery arriving. And then 92% say they will buy, buy again if the returns are easy. Now, these existing trends in combination with the current global situation has disrupted and or exacerbated the pre-pandemic status quo. So what can we expect going forward? Um, retail industry predictions, uh, according to global data's COVID-19 cross-sector impact reports, um, shows us that there's a couple of predictions. Um, I'm not gonna read through the whole thing just for the interest of time. And I've tried to highlight the most important pieces. The most agile retailers will win, again, coming back to Queen's presentation as well. Agility is going to be key. Consumers are still spending more time at home. So even though we've opened up or we've moved down to a lower lockdown level, um, it's almost as if there's a, been a shift towards companies specifically allowing people to work from home, where obviously where it's possible. Um, In-store uh, employees will always be required, at least for the medium to long term. Retailers should prepare for online penetration to remain raised in the aftermath of the crisis. That's another prediction I think we can, we can logically um, assume. And then marketing will focus more on personal health and well-being, which is also very important. You, know, you, want, to, you want to feel safe um, for, as a customer going forward, but also as an employee. You want to feel that your employer is looking after you if they should require you to work in store. So what are some of the retail, the, the mitigation strategies that retailers can have a look at? Again, lots of words on a slide. So again, I tried to highlight the most important ones as it pertains to my presentation. Short-term strategies from a six to 12 months uh, a window, 
Um, there are a, no, a number of them. The one I want to highlight here is the maintaining the engagement with customers through websites, social media, and live streaming. To the midterm strategies, accelerate investment and development of digital transformation across business. This is a, a very big topic, which I'll touch on just in a second. Advance uh, research and accelerate the changes in consumer behavior, uh, very key for, for um, businesses to understand the consumers and how they behave in their buying journey. And then obviously uh, um, you know, being there where they need them. And then reviewing store presence and reinforcing multi-channel alignment between physical and online with where applicable. Right, digital transformation. Business agility is critical. So again, uh, I think as with Alistair, we've, I've just basically told the internet, um, apart from just to give you some evidences, if you will, or receipts on what we're talking about. Digital transformation, it's top of, top of mind, top of tongue, and it's been accelerating or has accelerated dramatically over the last few months. Um, these are a couple of articles. Digital transformation uh, is top of mind. SA companies, COVID-19, accelerating Africa's digital transformation agenda, accelerated digital transformation uh, for, of businesses. These are all main topics in uh, discussion in our industries. A recent uh, report uh, done, uh, the Twilio COVID-19 digital engagement report recently run now, it's mostly focused on UK, but I think there are definitely parallels we can draw with, uh, with South Africa. Um, COVID-19 was the digital accelerant of the decade. So digital transformation has been a topic of discussion for a few years now, but of course it's been hyper accelerated over the last uh, a few months. Um, in some cases, uh, they state that the, the company's digital communication strategy by a global average of six years, so it's accelerated by six years or shortened that time um, at the outline. Uh, previous inhibitors to innovation has been broken down. So some reasons why people would not go ahead with the digital transformation has been broken down. Digital communications is the, the new lifeblood of, for business. Um, all global companies, 95%, are seeking new ways of engaging customers as a result of COVID-19. Um, digital technologies have opened um, up definite future remote work opportunities. Again, coming back to the working from home uh, um, logic or, or capabilities. Um, and specifically in the retail side, um, retail businesses, um, that possibility is about 69%, obviously because we know we still have brick and mortar that obviously cannot support work from home. And of course, the large brands and retailers are responding in kind. Uh, here are a couple of snippets and articles and announcements from you know, the big brands, I suppose, uh, mostly global, uh, where they've announced either work from home policies up to the end of this year or even up to uh, into deep into next year. And I think Microsoft's actually going ahead with permanent work from home uh, 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 capabilities. Now, obviously, it's easy because in their world, they're already digital, digitalized, if you will, um, but that Oh, uh, that almost inevitably have a knock-on effect uh, to the smaller and medium and smaller businesses out there. And then of course, these large retailers, because they've got the digital footprint, and again, talking to uh, 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 Queen's presentation, is how do you then get customers to buy digitally online something that they would normally have to do in store? So for instance, IKEA, um, having a augmented reality app where you can visualize the furniture in your home before you purchase it. Amazon having, you know, taking a photo of yourself and then testing out the makeup and see what that would look like. Nike, determining the actual size of your shoe because that's one of the things I always have a problem with. I never know what size of shoe to buy if I want to buy online. And something like Warby Parker where you can actually try on glasses um, in the app. So all of these technologies making it easier for us to do that which we are wanting to do currently, which is shop online. And then of course, Acceleration of online retail. I mean, that's almost a given. You can see WhatsApp's now opening uh, in-app shopping as well within WhatsApp, uh, driven by Facebook. So that's going to be a big one across uh, the African uh, continent because you use WhatsApp heavily, but also in EMEA. 7-Eleven, mostly US, I suppose, as delivery uh, providers, as small baskets, the e-commerce accelerates. And just recently announced every shop uh, is going to be a big competitive take a lot locally. They're backed by JD Group. Um, which is, uh, they run a high five corp and incredible connection. So competition is definitely heating up. And then of course, the growth of online, re online retail in South Africa. So approximately 40% during, uh, grew by 40% during COVID-19 lockdown. And we see a boom of, boom of online shopping in SA. All right. So those are all articles I will, but let's get a little bit down to core facts. So just doing a little bit of research 
if you look at our big name online retailers, not necessarily groceries, but let's say the normal places you would normally mention when we talk about online retail in South Africa. The first, the orange bar is showing the April website traffic. And then we can see the dramatic increase of online traffic on these sites um, across the following months, so May, June, July, August, September. So, I mean, an average of 137% increase on take a lot side, 51% increase uh, on better buy, 74% increase on one day only. So that just underscores, you know, that increase of people going online looking for services. But of course, coming back to the cart abandonment um, point, because of that increase of traffic, we can see cart abandonment also increasing dramatically. So if you look across um, the last decade, um, we can see it was steadily increasing already, the cart abandonment side of things, but it's peaking in 2020. I, I suppose that's almost um, logical to assume. And if you look at all the, the verticals, um, automotive being the worst at this point in time, um, I suppose because you know the, the, the mechanics and the petrol heads out there, um, they like to feel the part before they actually go ahead and purchase it. But it's, and, and retail is running around 84.51%. So it's really high, which means that all this all equates to lost opportunities for those online retailers to close their sales. And uh, due to the things we've discussed already, online channel, uh, omni-channel service gap, uh, digital transformation, that's all adds to the difficulties of online retail or retailers having at least some portion of online presence if they hadn't had before to get these consumers you know, not to lose that, that market share because once you've lost that market share, it's very difficult to get it back. And then on top of that, um, if we look on the global, global brands, we can see that people spend very little time on those sites when, when they're actually there. So you're spending a lot on marketing to get people to the site and then they only stay there a, a short period of time before they move on to something else if they don't find the product they were looking for. And if we look locally to our, let's say local South Africanized or Africanized uh, statistics, it's very similar. Conga, it's more uh, Nigerian side, they, uh, they're the outlier. But if we look at uh, the others, um, the average is less than eight minutes on your site. So what that means is that you have a really short window of time or short window of the right timing to actually, if you have a digital strategy to engage those customers via omni-channel strategies to get them to stay with you and stay loyal with you, and the reason, uh, the, the method and how to do that is obviously through data, know your customer, um, know what they've done before, know where they're coming from, um, and then combining that with technology such as AI. And that's exactly where Genesis comes in. So from a predictive engagement side, it's really the ability of using all of this data when customers go online and go to your digital footprint to qualify the visitor's buying intent through real-time analysis of the activities, then predict the buying interest to determine the most appropriate offer or action to, to present to them. Obviously, when you when you are analyzing and, 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 and seeing the customers on your site, it's not to try to disrupt their journey. They're all very savvy on how to do that, but if they see if you see that they are stuck or, or predict that they will uh, abandon their, their shopping cart, that's the moment where we want to engage them. All right. Then, right time, right channel, identify the perfect moment to engage via the most effective channel. And then, of course, when you engage, and this is the missing part. Um, a lot of online retailers have, um, let's say, checking capability, if you will. Um, but mostly those are driven with static rules. And when you engage, it's you, you need to start the engagement in most cases. Um, but the capability there is to engage it with the, the prospect with the best first resource. Now, if it's a low product value, if we uh, think back to that, uh, the traffic that we've seen, the increase of traffic, it's very likely that you won't have the, uh, like, like we like to call the bums in seats, the staff to actually handle that influx of engagement required. So for maybe for lower value engagements, first try to, to use automation in the form of bots or knowledge based um, article search to assist those customers. And then for the higher value ones, engage them with a properly skilled human resource. And that's one of those missing pieces where we have to get the human into the, into the conversation to show that empathy. And when you get all of that right, when you get that uh, with all the correct insight and context to the, the human resource, that's when you get more conversions and start to decrease that cart abandonment. So I'm just doing a time check. Um, all right. So we've had some real world, uh, uh, real world results. Now it's not specifically retail, um, but it is, basically the same concept. 
So with uh, years one with Ethiopian Airlines, um, Genesis Predictive Engagement is enabling us to capture significant, uh, significantly more window shoppers on our website. Conversion rates rose by 14% in the first two weeks and by 49% at the six week stage. And so uh, we've only really scratched the surface of what the tool can do. And that's a quote from their CIO. But it's not just about the online sales, it's about digital transformation and being agile in order to respond to the situation. Now, of course, the airline industry uh, was one of the worst hits. And with um, Ethiopian Airlines having, uh, having already embarked on their digital transformation journey just before um, um, the situation happened, um, using Genesis technologies in the cloud, they were able to uh, see a 25% increase in service levels, 60% uh, a faster call response, 17% fewer abandoned calls, and then very importantly, towards the topic of this discussion, 49% increase in website sales conversations and 72% reduction in website dwell time. So what that really means, or if you can summarize it into a, let's say a paragraph, it says an effective pandemic response without adding headcount, very important, whilst increasing sales and enhancing customer experience. So I think any business that can get those parameters right in this day and age or in this climate, um, we'll see success. Uh, at my, just, uh, just from my perspective, I want to show the, the, uh, the participants a very quick, let's say real-time or online active demo quickly, um, if I have the time. So um, can you confirm whether we have another five or at most 10 minutes? Ken, uh, Admar, could you please let us know whether we've got a, an extra five minutes? I'd like to ask, uh, you know, get people to ask questions as well. Uh, particularly, I can, yeah, yeah. I let the, and again, I don't have to do the demonstration. It's nice to see it, but I think I've, I've, I've passed the idea around what, what I'm trying to say pretty well. So for those that um, we can definitely go to questions and answers, I think, or... Okay, okay. Yeah. I, I'm interested yeah. to see here. I've got someone saying they'd like to see the demo. Yes. Okay. No, please, please. I can do it. it I can. I can. I can do it. Uh, I'm gonna try to do it in, as quickly as I possibly can. Okay. So just give me one second. Let me just. While you while you uh, uh, put it on, just yep. to say there is a uh, an assessment um, which is available. Please, everyone, fill it in uh, because it's very helpful to know how how these events go. So if you could do the assessment while Peter is putting on his video. Thanks, over to you, Peter. Thank you. So I stopped my share too quickly. So let me just quickly set the stage, um, just to set the background. So our protagonist for this demonstration is Peter. He's, uh, Peter's company has implemented the work from home policy. Um, concerned about frequent visits to the grocery store, as an example, Peter is looking for a safer, more efficient way of providing for his family. So he's got two specific, um, let's say, uh, decision points. The price, is, the price is right. So with financial pressures rising, uh, Peter wants a cost-effective solution. And of course, safety. Uh, Peter's primary concern is safety. He also suffers from a nut allergy. Uh, he needs to ensure that the food um, he orders is, of course, nut free and something um, easily achieved previously from reading the label in pro products in store. So with that now being the case, and we go... Let me just see what am I sharing? Am I, do you see the, the website um, at this point in time? We see, have the farm delivered to your door. All right, perfect, perfect. Okay, okay. so I'm, I'm, I'm here and playing Peter the protagonist at the moment. So when we look at Peter, he's looking at the website. Now in the background, under the hood, we've got, uh, uh, apologies, we've got Genesis Cloud running. So this is talking about digital transformation, being able to work from home, enabling your, your workforce to you know, engage with your customers from anywhere, um, just using a browser as an example, um, and being able to function accordingly. So the reason why I'm doing this, I want to show you what's hap what happens under the hood whilst Peter's now actually coming to your website and browsing the website. So we have the cloud platform and under the hood, what's, what's happening whilst Peter is actually browsing the site. All right. Refreshing that page. Been open for a while. Let me just find myself. All right, 
So I'm going to log in as Peter. Peter's on the site. He's created an account and he's logging into the site, right? If I refresh the site, let me get to my journey. Where am I? There we go. All right. He's looking for a, a meal plan. So he doesn't want to go to the shop to go buy groceries. He wants to order um, from Cloud to Table, which is one of the online providers doing grocery shopping. Um, it's a fictitious company, of course. So he goes and he wants to see what the plans are or what plans are available. He wants with meat. He's got a family of four. He wants four dinners in, uh, per week. And he goes ahead and goes, get cooking. Right. Now, at the same time, and I'm going to drag this across just so you can see what, what's happening under the hood. So we're tracking Peter, and we can see that he's um, added the product to his cart. So now he's going to put in some information. Put in his name. And apologies for me having to type this in. Should have pre like that. I'm just going to say, okay, great. That's all fine. And I continue. Oh, yeah, it would help if I put the right information. So we, again, now we can see in real time, uh, Peter's submitted the form. Now this is why we're gathering the data. We need to understand what Peter's doing on the site. And we can also predict, we're predicting with AI whether he's going to actually go ahead with the subscription. Peter then goes ahead. And whilst I'm doing that, let me just go on queue. Peter goes ahead and he says, great, I want it for six months. And for him, the price looks okay. And he goes to check out. Now something goes wrong. So he goes back and now he doesn't understand what's happening. The, the, the product couldn't purchase. There was something wrong with the checkout process. So what's happening is because we've abandoned, he's abandoned that, he's abandoned his cart, not because he's um, not, not by static rule, but because he's abandoned the cart and the, the, project, the predictability or the, the probability is not very high. We're offering him a chance to engage with somebody. So he can fill in his information. He says, great, I want to speak to somebody. He's very happy because he also remembers that he never checked whether the product actually has uh, nut or nuts inside. So that this was happening under the hood. So now from an agent's perspective, the agent now receives this interaction. Now, very importantly, when the agent then goes into that information, so bringing that customer information together for the agent to be able to show empathy to the customer to understand what's happening and where they're coming from, we can see the the agent now has a visibility. He's, he's on the website now, so you can say, hi, Peter, because we've identified him. He's logged in. And then the agent, in the meantime, can see exactly what Peter was doing. You can see that he added the meal plan. You can see that he formed the, submitted the form. Um, something went wrong over here because he abandoned. And because of that, Peter's saying, um, I have nut allergies. As an example, um, does your food as an example, the agent can say no, or not free as an example. All right, so he's now, he, he's um, uh, confirmed there's no nut, so that's all good. Um, and perhaps the agent at this point in time helps to uh, guide him to why the registration um, on the form or the checkout did not work. And by doing that, with having the context of the customer, we can also see previous inbound calls from him, previous web chats, even previous web visits, if he was online previously. The agent has access to all the data that he needs to understand what Peter, need, what, what Peter um, is trying to do or what he wants to buy and all the previous histories to show that empathy to him in order to help him to drive forward and then complete that purchase and um, resolve or avoid that cart abandonment um, from happening. So very short, I just have to cut it a little bit short just because we're running out of time, but it just gives you an idea of what digital transformation and being able to bring all that data together to an agent um, in order to help Peter you know, complete his buying uh, intent um, from, on the online retail store. 
Lita, thank you very much indeed. That was extremely interesting and, and very uh, enlightening and, and nicely um, uh, came after Queen's uh, uh, points about complaints and, and how we need to um, improve that and make sure that the, the customer's journey is, is as comfortable as possible. Can I ask any questions? Uh, we're down to 16 uh, attendees. The event feedback is here in front of you. Please do fill that in. Um, has anyone got any questions? No questions? Uh, you're all very quiet today. Um, can I then uh, just say that, um, uh, of course, Black Friday will be coming up. It's in a month's time now, um, at the end of November. And therefore, obviously, you will all be looking at ways in which you can improve your customer relations and make sure that the, your customer relations is top, top class in order to avoid uh, complaints. It, it, I think it's very important uh, to ensure that the um, uh, complaints are dealt with quickly, etc. Can I take a question? Yes, uh, Mr. Nyati here has a question. Thank you, please. Awesome presentation. Thank you, Mara. Thank you, Alex. I've got a question for Peter. Peter, I just want to find out the uh, solution that is this panel. Is it available as a single or alternatively on a trial basis? Uh, so, so, sorry, uh, can you just repeat that? It was just biking up a little bit. Oh, sorry, can you hear me clearly now? I'm audible. Yeah, that sounds a little bit better, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, in short, I was saying the solution that you just demoed, is it available as a premium or is there like a trial version that's available? It's, uh, it's basically cloud, uh, a, a native cloud um, solution in AWS, built on AWS microservices. It's not something that's hosted in the cloud somewhere. It's actually it's like Netflix, basically, if you, if you think about it that way. Um, so we do have, as Genesis, we do have options for customers. We have what we call a, um, a, a customer, almost like test drive, where you can try it out yourself um, uh, for a week or two. And then if you want to go into a more, more of a, let's say, more of a formal trial, you can also do that at no cost. Um, and then from there, you can also go POC. And so, so there's various options, but you can definitely try it out um uh, for free um as part of that program so if you go to genesis.com and you go to genesis cloud you'll follow you'll see the uh, the links to where you can actually do that awesome thanks a lot peter okay Fusa, sorry for that uh has anyone else got any questions otherwise i will finish we are actually nearly 15 minutes over time and I see our attendees uh, are disappearing by the moment. Uh, as I said, um, many of you, I'm sure, will be uh, going towards Black Friday, preparing for Black Friday, which is uh, bound to be a much longer period this year than, than in previous years. So we wish you every success uh, and make sure that you are um, well prepared uh, that your stocks are up, uh, that your uh, logistics are well sorted and have a, a great time. Success and thank you all very much indeed. Admire, do you want to say one last word? Uh, just uh, thank you to Genesis for sponsoring the event. Uh, I hope everyone uh, had uh, uh, interesting insights uh, from all the presentations that were done today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thanks very much, Queen and Peter. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Queen. You. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you, Admire. Thank you.